hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ed Barton. I'm a research director at Coretta Research. Um, we formed a firm about three years ago, and I just want to give you a little bit of context um, around our methodology and what I'm basing the observations uh, that I'm going to be making to you over the next 20 minutes. Um, we are consultants and analysts and data experts. Um, we're up to about 15 people now. And our methodology relies very much on what we directly observe in the marketplace for technology. Media technology is extremely important to us. It's probably the greater part of our business. We also look at sports technology, advertising technology, and telecoms technology. When we look at the technology market, we put a huge amount of effort into working out which vendor is deploying which technology or solution to which buyer. So what we're going to be looking at today is a lot of the patterns and trends that we are seeing by looking directly at technology deployments with sports buyers and sports distributors. The other thing we do, naturally, as analysts, is we size and we forecast how much people are spending on those technologies. And um, you know, we think when you gather enough data, when you look at enough deployments, when you look at enough technology verticals, you can start seeing some kind of interesting, interesting trends uh, in, in the aggregate. We also spend a lot of time talking to technology buyers, Hollywood studios, at broadcasters, at pay TV operators, and uh, of course, at sports organizations themselves, um, which arguably over the last few years have increasingly become media organizations as they increase their investments on video, in fan engagement technologies, uh, and a number of other things besides. You may have discerned from the title of my presentation, uh, I'm not wholly optimistic about the um, short-term future of sports broadcasting when we look at it perhaps through an, an economic or a growth-oriented lens. Um, my company was fortunate enough to share some thoughts uh, with an SVG audience at the IBC conference in Amsterdam last September. And I kind of had a quick look back to that presentation given by my colleague Rebecca. And, um, you know, some of the big things we said is, you know, of course, sports viewing is increasingly shifting uh, online, the amount of content um, which is uh, licensed by, you know, specialist streaming services like the zone, the amount of streaming content which is distributed by sports leagues and sports clubs on a direct to consumer or as I like to say a direct to fan basis has exploded over the last few years a lot of sports clubs now have their own subscription video service for example and of course you know the shift online has a number of implications for the technology purchasing decisions and the volume of technology being acquired by those organizations. We work with a lot of vendors. It's been a, it's been a pretty cool few years for, um, for uh, vendors targeting the sports segment with uh, video and fan engagement technologies in particular. Um, we also had a little look at some of the new technologies around you know, uh, VR and you know, augmented reality in particular. Um, and we, we, we highlighted perhaps some of the you know, some, some of the more innovative um, methods of, of engaging with your favorite sport uh, that, that, that are coming down the line. I think when we think about where we are today, and you know, I think one point I'd like to make is that you know, in my presentation, I'm looking at the entire sports ecosystem. I think when a lot of the discussion around live sports is taking place, people tend to focus on perhaps the top sort of 12 to 15 most popular sports in the world. Of course, the world of sports is way, way wider than that. And we're very, very interested in you know, what's going on at the different tiers all the way down to you know, some of the smaller sporting organizations. There are, you know, parents want to be able to stream the sports of their children's um, sports teams at academic institutions. You know, these are increasingly investing in streaming technology. Um, fixing some of the issues that we see, we think is relatively challenging in the short term. However, there are a few longer term strategies, largely enabled by technology, unsurprising when you look at it through our perspective, which we think might help. But there are no quick fixes. Um, there is no silver bullet 
so to speak, to address the malaise that we see. So when we think about, you know, what's the trouble here? What's the problem? In the US, we're seeing the big American leagues. They're re-upping some of their, their long-term rights deals. Valuations for those guys are going up. But we think about how much new money is entering entertainment spending in general. There is no new money. What we see is we see money from the existing pie being shifted from one bit to the other. No additional spending that we can discern is growing the overall pie. The discussion around younger audiences is particularly impactful. It's been going, a lot, it's been going on for a while. Um, younger audiences obviously spend a lot of their time getting their entertainment from non-linear uh, television and non-pay TV sources. Um, we all know about the declines in pay TV subscriptions. The problem with that for live sports is, of course, that pay TV and broadcasters have been the biggest purchasers of sports rights historically. Those guys are in existential trouble, and there will be less of them in the 2030s, meaning that the competition for rights driving up valuations is going to disappear, and the trend is going to reverse in some markets that it already has. There aren't many big buyers of sports rights. It only takes one buyer to leave to, or dial down their involvement in a given territory to have a pretty big impact on rights valuations in, in that market. Um, and, you know, the, 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 all of these things that we keep being told are gonna, are gonna save the situation. Uh, Amazon's gonna come in and spend an absolute ton. Um, Netflix is going to do this. Apple has done that. We think that, first of all, they're not spending enough to compensate for the declines we discern in the longer term. And secondly, actually, big tech and the streaming services we think have been some of the smartest and savviest buyers of sports rights around. They are pretty opportunistic. They pick off particular, quite often small rights packages which address their particular commercial objectives. I'm thinking about you know, Prime Video acquiring, say, rights packages on big shopping days to drive the ad business and Prime subscriptions and the retail business. Um, social networks are fantastic for engagement, but not monetization. I strongly echo our chairman's observations around the importance of monetization when we are thinking about entertainment distribution and preserving the long-term health and viability uh, of a sport. So, when we're thinking about fixing it, you know, what are some of the things we can do? Um, you know, when we think about massive explosions in the valuation of sports rights in the past, they've generally been associated to drive adoption and usage and uptake of a particular technology, cable TV being the classic example. Some of the recent um, big technology uh, evolutions have not had to rely to anywhere near the same extent on sports, so we're wondering, you know, where that kind of huge pop might come from. We've talked a little bit about a big tech, are the global SVODs going to help us out? <laughs> We, don't, we, we think that's uh, only to a limited extent. And fixing the, and addressing the requirements of younger audiences in how they consume sports and how we monetize sports to younger audiences is, is, is pretty challenging, but you know, there is some interesting stuff going on. Again, um, there's an interesting technology angle in how you address an audience for whom perhaps the mobile handset is the primary screen. But again, you know, what, what is the monetization angle um, on that? Younger audiences are spending a huge amount of time on um, social networks such as TikTok, and it's going to be really fascinating to hear from, from, from the individual from TikTok who's going to be uh, talking later. And, you know, we think the engagement story is, is, is absolutely fantastic, and we note that... Um, you know, there's a, there's a reasonable amount of technology investment around vertical video um, and, uh, and enabling, you know, a sports experience through that. We think that the, you know, there, there's certainly uh, an adjustment in one's editorial approach to engaging younger audiences on social networks, which we think is not particularly well understood at major media organizations. Um, you know, one of the most successful in the world, the leading news organization uh, on TikTok in the world, I believe, is the Daily Mail and General Trust. And I was fascinated to learn the other day that they have, I think, 17 video editors purely devoted to TikTok. 
Uh, this is a, you know, the, you, you really have to have a particular voice, a particular editorial standpoint, a particular style of communication, I think, to resonate on those platforms. And it's utterly distinct from the ones that um, certainly people of my generation are accustomed to. So we think about the impact on spending, on what we've kind of fought, sort of composed a bucket of what we believe are the media technology segments which directly address um, the production and distribution of live sports. We've stuck our forecast for sports data tools, video review systems, live production graphics, some really cool stuff going on there, virtual sets, obviously content protection, brand and brand protection, um, and merchandising sort of counterfeit uh, countermeasures is, is pretty important as well. Uh, cloud and software live production, fan engagement and league management tools, quite a lot of things come into those buckets, um, but, but another area which is growing relatively fast, and live sports graphics, which is another area which has evolved rapidly uh, over the last few years. I mean, you can see it in the chart, you know, over the last decade or so, it's been a, a pretty healthy growth story um, for companies selling that type, of, uh, that type of technology, we think it's going to be around a $2 billion market uh, come 2027. All of these components are not growing, obviously, at the same rate. We see the most growth in fan engagement technologies, um, and we also see, I think, um, a very limited level of growth in, in, in content protection in particular, if I had to... Um, pick one out, which appears to be kind of considered a, a sort of a, a necessary IT investment rather than, um, rather than a, a direct opportunity for uh, longer term monetization. Um, but within the fan engagement technologies, um, you know, we're talking about things like um, the companies which enable some level of interactivity uh, with the live broadcast. Um, we noticed also some interesting things going on around the sort of the sales funnel, which goes from perhaps a poll uh, or some type of quiz kind of through sort of, um, you know, is this person going to score a goal into, you know, some form of real money, um, betting and gaming, doing relatively well as well. So there's, there's, some, there's some pretty interesting things going on. Uh, and I think the other observation that we'd make, which we think is relatively interesting, we, 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 we also track sports rights in the same way we track technology deployments, um, is that there is, you know, at the top end, of course, when we think about the most, the most popular sports, um, you know, these are, these are, we count it, this, this is a count of how many rights are actually being sold into uh, entertainment distributors by sports leagues and clubs. Um, and I think, you know, the interesting thing is that there is an incredibly long tail of uh, smaller sports which have not been, up till now, um, as successful at uh, gaining distribution deals, at uh, monetizing their sports through um, consumption over traditional media channels. And, you know, we spent some time working with some of them, thinking about what is the best way to ensure that you know you are getting the exposure, you are engaging audiences, and um, you know you are you are ensuring that your sport has a long term, um, a long term, hopefully success story, as we head into the 2030s, the 2040s, <laughs> and beyond, and perhaps that you are more taking charge of your own destiny rather than uh, being at the mercy of broader market forces over which you have little control. So, um, how do we think, how do we, how do we kind of get out of this um, predicament? And, you know, we think it's a short-term squeeze. Um, you know, we don't have to tell the NBA or the NFL or the EPL, you know, how to do this. These are, these, these are, these are wonderful growth stories and, um, you know, they're still, they are still growing in and of themselves, even if it's not their fault. They are sucking the oxygen out of the room for all of the other sports that might seek a traditional um, media and entertainment distribution based parts of their audience. We spend a lot of time thinking about how different sports organizations are tiered. So, you know, the NFL is not the same as the Wheelchair Football Association. Their requirements are totally different. Their ability to deploy technology is completely different. The amount of money 
they can spend is very different. And this is what I mean when I say, you know, if you look at some of the technology deployments in the aggregate, you can start seeing some interesting patterns. Right at the top end of the global elite, there tend to be a small number of vendors that you know, are addressing these requirements. And those vendors change as we go all the way through the tiers, all the way down. The amount that they can spend is hugely different as well. We reckon the global elite can spend about $60 million a year on their media technology spending. In the, in the, next, in the next tier, we think that goes down to somewhere like you know, $12.5 to $15 million a year. And of course, the number of organizations in each tier varies hugely. So, the technology you need to distribute live sports changes a lot depending on how big you are, what your aspirations are, how complex your requirements are, your needs for different types of monetization technologies. And you know, this is a kind of a, a broad representation of sort of how we've, seen this, um, how we've seen this evolving in some of the organizations that we've worked with both on the vendor and the buyer side. However, we said that there are different number of, of organizations within each tier. The deal sizes and the spending patterns are different. Obviously, when we speak to a lot of vendors, they're like, we're tier one. We only go for those. We're like, how many, how many sports organizations do you think there are in tier one? It's about 12 to 15, spending 60 million US dollars a year. That's not a huge number of RFPs to try to sustain your business if, you don't, if you're not in bed with one of the absolute monsters of, 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 um, of global sports and entertainment. Obviously, you know, as you go down towards the amateur level, the number of entities climbs hugely, but the average technology spend and the overall market opportunity of targeting that segment obviously diminishes. So, you know, if you're working with the global elite, if you're media kind working with the NBA or something like that, you can throw a team of 100 developers at it, you can customize things, you can be incredibly sophisticated about how you uh, approach the challenge of satisfying your company customers' requirements. If you're trying to address semi-professional and amateur, these are the tiers at which we see a much higher level of productization, a much higher level of sort of off-the-shelf technology. A lot of the organizations, you know, even when we're in the professional and lower league tiers, the level of technical expertise within those organizations might not stretch to much more than someone who is configuring an email server and Microsoft Office apps for the admin team. And um, you know, suddenly they want to launch a, uh, a, a live streaming subscription-based service so that they can show you know, reserve team matches, behind-the-scenes interviews, and other associated uh, content which might be complementary to a much larger rights deal which they uh, participate in centrally with their peers in the leagues. We do think that another angle for sports organizations to consider is in maximizing and leveraging the value of their fans and their audiences. Um, and this is, this is something we think is essential to take charge of your own destiny. And you know, we are fascinated endlessly by the variety and the volume of the types of ways that you know, sports organizations can both engage with and can sell to their particular fan bases. Of course, all of these is, is, enabled, by, is enabled by technology, and there are very few sports organizations in the world that can truly say they, they speak to, to all of these. But when we think about realistically operating and building a business with this level of complexity, particularly when we start going down outside of the biggest tiers, you know, th there, there is one essential thing which binds all of this together, and it's data. And so actually, when we start thinking about, okay, sports organizations streaming more, you know, what does that result in? You know, video is data. A lot of the most important things to drive a video business or a streaming business or engaging your fans is, is based on data. We go back to this, you know, in the, in the old world, all of these things, all of these types of data tended to live in different places. What we are increasingly seeing, and there are actually you know, 
telling a few organizations that they should think about is you need to have a holistic data strategy. You need to ensure that your data is stored in an unstructured way, usually within the data lake, which enables you to build applications on top of it, which utilize, which ag which utilize different bits of data together in many and various ways. So, you know, one example being, you know, a sports audience is incredibly passionate and incredibly valuable to advertisers. How do you target and segment those realistically? Um, you know, there, there are a number of ways in which you can do that if we're thinking about data clean rooms and targeting to preserve GDPR and privacy, which really help you to maximize the value of a very passionate audience and fan base. And I think, um, when we talked about some of these possibilities, even just a few years ago, they would only have been available to you know, the global elite. What we've seen increasingly from the vendor side is you know, more of a willingness to make some of these tools available to smaller organizations, making them easier to deploy, less complex to deploy, requiring less customization, less internal technical expertise, more of a managed service um, angle if you don't have the internal resource to operate uh, and, manage, and manage such things. So I kind of jumped ahead and just sort of lost my train of thought. Excuse me, and, and, I, and, I've, and I've also run out of time, so I'm, I'm really kicking myself up the butt here. But to, to round things off, um, look, for, for, for vendors targeting sports organizations, I'll go back to our chairman's comment around monetization. Absolutely critical. We were at NAB um, a few weeks ago, and every buyer we spoke to there, they were like, we're not really interested in anything at the moment. We, we, you know, we're struck, we don't have an IT budget sitting around to be spent on these fun things. We can only get approval for spending from our finance teams if we can see a very rapid and clear path to a return on investment on that spending. Otherwise, we're not even interested at the moment. So, you know, for vendors need to know how to sell to finance teams as well as to technologists. And the types of technology which are being sold in our world at the moment are around monetization. Advertising technology is doing pretty well. Payments and subscription management is doing pretty well. Stuff to do with data, which enables you to make more money, is doing pretty well as well. Um, and, uh, you know, when we think about smaller sports outside of, you know, the, the, the giants, who are going to be absolutely fine. Um, you know, I'm thinking, how do we grow? We think about perhaps sports which once were much larger than they are now. We think about, you know, I always think about snooker and darts in the, in the UK, which you know, when, when, I was a, when I was a youngster were much, much bigger than they are now. Now, how do, we know, how do we take control of our own destiny? How do we ensure that we're still around for darts fans in the 2040s? And, uh, you know, we think, there's no, there's no single solution which is going to work, but we think it's going to be a combination of taking charge of your own destiny by developing your own routes to the audience and by developing the data infrastructure which will enable you to engage with and maximize the value of your fans and your audiences most effectively. I'm very sorry for going over time. Uh, Heather, if you'd like the deck, um, please feel free to use the QR code. Um, and thanks very much for, uh, for, for giving me the time to, to speak to you. Thank you.